Hello and welcome to episode 111 of Chairside Live, episode 111. We've got an interesting episode for you today. It's part two of my interview with Dr. Aaron Elliott. As you might recall, Dr. Elliott is the one, if you recall from part one, who got very involved with snoring and sleep apnea, which we explored last time we talked to her. And in part two of my interview with her, we're going to talk about something else near and dear to my heart, her involvement with Six Month Smiles. When I got out of school, well, about five years when I, after I got out of school, I started doing some traditional orthodontics, and I really loved it. I really liked being able to move teeth around, and uh, later on, I started doing some orthodontics with aligners, and I was always frustrated because I never felt like I could move teeth like I could when I had bonded that bracket right onto the front, stuck a wire and elastic in there. I felt like it was a steering wheel that I had on the tooth, and I could do whatever I wanted with it bodily move the tooth, and I never felt like I could do that with aligners. Um, Erin kind of feels the same way. We'll take a peek maybe at a case of hers that she has, and we'll discuss what she's been able to do with six-month smiles in her. She hasn't been out of school all that long, not nearly as long as me, but she's dove into this and has a lot of experience and is currently teaching for them. We'll also take a look at our case of the week first, and I happened to be walking through the Crown and Bridge Department, and I noticed a lot of H and H impressions and I don't want to pick on them but I'm just going to put this under the category of cordless impressions and I know dentists want to be able to take cordless impressions or at least faster impressions and have them turn out just as well I'm not sure H and H is the best way to accomplish this but I am going to show you an alternative that I think might be a way to get cordless impressions that we will be more than happy to deal with here at the laboratory in fact let's take a look at that now On this week's Case of the Week, I just wanted to highlight something that, um, you know, it's kind of a pattern that we see ongoing in the laboratory, and that is dentists trying to, oh, I don't know if I should say cut corners, but I think that's kind of what it is, just kind of trying to take a good impression with the least amount of work, or take an impression with the least amount of work. So I just wanted to show a couple impressions here utilizing the H and H technique, and I really don't want this to be an indictment against that because there's dentists I know who are having success with this system. It's more uh, as we look at these impressions. It's really more about trying to take a cord-free impression and get a good result. I don't, I don't think anybody's ever argued that. Oh my gosh, the H and H technique is more accurate than packing two retraction cords and taking impressions that way. I think we know there's compromises with it, but. You know, at the same time, it's less work because we don't have to pack cord, maybe less damage to the patient's periodontal tissues. We're just, you know, it's, it's from dentists looking for an easier way. So let's look at this first one. We can see, you know, not great marginal detail. And up around, you know, the top of the impression, you can see where you clearly see two distinct layers here. In fact, you can even see a shadow being, you know, uh, caused on the light blue by the dark blue material. And as we look at this... Um, impression uh, from the distal. Again, we could see if I were to reach in and take this material around the back right around here, I would be able to lift this up and lift this out of it. And this is one of the reasons we tend to see remakes due to really tight fits uh, on these impressions. And it's pretty easy as we go through impressions to spot which are the H and H techniques because if you recall, we've highlighted it before on the show, uh, but the patient bites together after the prep is done, they open uh, the, the double arch tray with the set impression material stays on the opposing arch and you squirt more material around the preps and the patient bites back together. And here we can see multiple layers. We can actually see right along this border that this uh, impression material set at a different time than the blue bite registration material. In fact, it even seems to have set at a different time than this green material in this area right along here. And so it looks like it's been relined twice. And yes, in some areas you can see the margin, but you never see anything beyond the margin. And that really for us is when we know we've captured the entire margin, is when we not only see the margin in the impression, but we see some two structure beyond the margin. Regardless of how small that little tag may be, it shows us that we've reached the end of the impression. So when we see multiple layers of impressions like this, we know we're gonna have to put a ton of die spacer on and that we still might have a problem with the occlusion um, being high, and I walked and I just found this other example too. And you can see in this area where the white wash material and the bite registration material come together, you see space between it. You can see they set at different times. Uh, and again, as a result, you can take your finger and kind of lift this up. It's not a cohesive 
uh, unit that we have here because they did set at different times and we always get better results we find when they set simultaneously and you can see again that we've got impression material around the prep and one adjacent tooth but not the other two teeth and it makes you wonder it feels like we're going to have a double bite uh, probably on here and probably something tight and again you can see where the impression material is just stopped and could be lifted away and so we worry about the accuracy especially in a, in a plastic tray like this where it's not even done in a very rigid metal tray so i get it i mean i get i know that we all want to find an easier way to get the same result not just for us but for the patient as well but the double core technique kind of remains the gold standard but i'm always willing to investigate uh, another way of being able to do things and make it a little easier. So I just wanted to share this with you. This was a patient that I treated um, the other day, and we're going to use a new impression system that I'm not, uh, I'm pretty close to endorsing it heavily. There's just one little change that I want the company to make on this, but this is the Aquacil cordless unit. So if you look at this, you can tell we've got an endodontically treated tooth on tooth number eight, and this, you know, we're going to be preparing this tooth uh, obviously for a crown. In fact, we're going to do a Bruxer crown here because we want to test and see um, exactly how much or how well the Bruxer is going to block out the dark stump shade. This is an area of research we've been working on a lot because as we make Bruxer more translucent, we want to make sure that it's still able to block out different shades. You can see that with my Vita Easy Shade Advanced, I keep getting an A2 shade, but I'm getting three different Vita 3D shades. And now there's another one where we get an A2, but the 3D shade that I get is a 2L 2.5. So A2 came up three different times, but three different Vita 3D shades. And this is why I'm so impressed with the Vita 3D shade system. A2, we all know, is the most common shade that we request, but really it's because it's just a huge bucket and holds all these other 3D shades that are actually much more accurate when it comes to breaking down uh, that A2 shades uh, into something more specific. And that's why the Vita 3D shade tabs really match teeth a lot better, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, than Vita Classic shades. So let's speed ahead just a little bit. We're going to put some topical on. We're going to anesthetize the tooth. And then we're going to go through our reverse prep sequence. I know you've seen this 100 times before, so I won't spend too much time on it. We're taking our 56 burr and we're gonna break the contacts uh, here on the mesial and then on the distal. Once we've broken the contact, you know, typically we would put in our first cord, our number, uh, our double zero cord. We're not gonna do that here though because I'm trying to do this with a cordless approach. So I'm using the round burr, the 801021 burr, and just scribing it along the marginal gingiva to make our, uh, basically prep our margin, but at the same time making sure we have a good gingival depth cut. This is a great way to be able to make a really nice margin. You should be able to see already that most of that margin is already formed. We're going to drop it a little bit. You can see that two structure, but I didn't want to take the round burr and hit the gingiva. Now we're going to go into place a one millimeter depth cut in the incisal edge by placing some incisal edge depth cuts. And here goes our axial depth cut right at the junction, right about the junction of the incisal third and the middle third. And so we've got our incisal edge depth cuts, we've got our axial depth cut, and we've got our uh, round burr at the gingival margin. And now we can just kind of fly along. This to me is our GPS unit telling us exactly where we want to end up. So using this 856 025 big workhorse burr, big wide burr, which I love so much, we're going to blend those depth cuts on the facial. There's the 379023 football burr being used on the lingual. And then 856025 won't fit uh, between a prep tooth and two unprepped teeth. So this is its little brother. It's exactly the same shape. It's an 856 burr. This just happens to be the 016 burr as opposed to the 025. Typically, once you take that through there a couple of times, it's big brother, the 856025 will fit in between there. And there's the mosquito tip burr being used where I don't want to drop it any farther subgingival, but I don't have enough separation between those two teeth. So I'm using that mosquito burr to create a little separation uh, between those two teeth without having to drop the margin too far subgingival. Towards the end of the preparation, just smoothing things off with the 856025 uh, burr. And here I am using it again, just making sure all the planes are blended together. And then towards the end of the preparation, I'm going to turn the water off, turn the speed down. And now I can really see what I'm doing. In fact, I often feel that for the first time with the water off, I can physically see what I'm doing. You know, I had the depth cuts to guide me through the rest of this preparation. 
But with the water off, and I've switched back to the 856.016, I must have felt like I was getting a little close to that adjacent tooth. And now I'm going in, and really you can see where I see just a line of powder where I'm prepping. There's no missing, you know, when I'm prepping on the facial, if I'm close to the gingiva or not. It's a great thing about an electric handpiece. It lets you turn the speed way down. And so here I am. You can see just tracing it along, almost like I was using a laser here and just kind of peeling it back. But I'm just kind of pushing that burr down, that 856025, dropping that tooth structure down just a little bit farther each time till I get down to the level of the gingiva. Like I said, normally in a corded impression, I'd have a double zero in there. Then I'd be putting a number two corn on it. This is Viscostat Clear from Ultradent. This is how we stop bleeding in the anterior. You got to scrub it pretty good. I'm, I'm leaning on that syringe and I'm scrubbing that tissue. The only bleeding that we really had was on the mesial. Now we're drying it off and we're going to place something called the B4. It's the letter B and the number four. I know it sounds like a print song. This is the B4 optimizer from Dentsply Caulk. They're the ones who make this um, uh, Aquacil cordless uh, system that you're about to see. And uh, so we've dried that off. And as we get ready, I'm going to stop it right here because I need some time to explain exactly what's, uh, what's going on here. You can see that the tip of the syringe is tiny. It's just, uh, just a little bigger than the size of a Perio probe. And it's an imp- on the end of an impression syringe, but there's no way you could ever squeeze this impression syringe uh, with your hand. And so it's activated by a handpiece that hooks onto your handpiece hose, and so it's air driven. So you can put the tip in like it was a perioprobe into the sulcus and then start expressing the material. So this is a big difference from the H&H technique where we're hoping to use a heavy body material to shove some stuff subgingival. I actually have the tip of this in the sulcus as I move it around the tooth. So now I'm not counting on the light body material to sneak under the sulcus. I actually have the tip in the sulcus squirting out material. And I think this is a a great idea. We're not going to get a better result here than we would from a two cord impression, but what we are going to do is get a better cordless impression than if we tried to use the H&H technique or maybe another cordless solution. I really like physically being able to inject the impression material subgingival, and you can see it's a little thin and wispy compared to what we would expect from the two cord technique as we look around at the area that's gone beyond the margin. If this were a two cord impression, that would be big, thick. It'd look like the Great Wall of China, I often describe it, or I use the word meaty, just because I like the word meaty, but it's big and thick, and when you pour it with dye stone, it won't bend back and forth. And this is not that. This is not that same type of impression, but we do have material beyond the margin, and that's important because now the technicians know exactly where it is. So as far as cordless impressions go, uh, I currently hold out a lot of hope for this system. I'm hoping to get them to tweak the impression material itself just a little bit to make it more like regular Aquacel. But as of now, if you want to take cordless impressions, you know, as of today, this is my best suggestion for you. I like this much better than the H&H technique. It's a simultaneous impression with both materials sitting at the same time, so we don't need to put nine or ten layers of dye spacer onto the prep or virtual dye spacer as it is now. And we don't have to worry about the occlusion because we don't get a lot of double impressions. The one question we added to our, when patients would come in and they would update their health history, it just said, if there was a um, non-surgical way to stop your spouse from snoring. Would you Would you be interested? So we kind of like you decided That's we should probably ask, ask the spouse because yep. people either uh, absolutely deny it or they don't think it's as bad as it is. And so it does seem to work with the spouse. And you have more women coming in uh, to the practice than the men themselves. So it seems to work. When I was practicing with uh, with Todd Morgan um, there at Scripps Encinitas there was a monthly sleep meeting at the hospital where everybody yeah. involved with the with sleep would get together and then we would kind of come in as the dentist as well and we'd watch uh, some of the surgeons uh, show slides of their UPP you know surgeries and just go oh wow this and it was kind of funny how it was like okay it started with CPAP and then it went yeah. through various levels of surgery and pillar implants and all kinds of things and then if nothing else worked everything else had failed then then, oral then, we'll, then, we'll, then we'll do the super aggressive treatment of two <laughs> alginates uh, to make a sleep appliance after we've hacked and cut this person all apart. And, and so it really is kind of doing 
a, a favor for them because you can always do surgery. You can always do that yeah. other stuff. Um, I don't think anybody disputes CPAP is obviously the, the gold standard if somebody can tolerate uh, wearing it, but I've seen uh, sleep docs just strictly advertise on the internet and other places. If you can't wear your CPAP, call me. You know, and and those are people who know they have a problem. I think they've been convinced enough to actually give CPAP a try, but they just can't handle sleeping with this mask on. Have you ever tried mm -hmm. sleeping for a night with a CPAP mask on just for fun? I tried for about five minutes. In fact, I know you made um, it that long. That's good. I have one here at the office, and I did have my staff put it on and try it. And so this is what, you know, not everyone is going to be able to tolerate it. And treating the, the staff spouses has been awesome, too, because they tell everyone about it. That's why we have such a, you know, volume coming in. And that's awesome down in San Diego that they're that, you know, advanced that they're considering oral appliances and keeping the dentist part of the team. And, you know, anyone watching this knows that we're not just tooth mechanics anymore. You know, we, the oral health is tantamount to the entire total body health. So, you know, that's just another tool in our kit to help people. And patients love it too. They're like, wow, you're, it's a holistic approach and it's just putting other piece, pieces of the puzzle together for the patients. Right. And, and I don't even think that the, I don't think the sleep docs are like the surgeons were kind of like, oh, come on in. We'd like to work with you. It was more like they did the surgery once, maybe twice, and six months mm -hmm. later, the patient was still snoring again. And it's kind of like, May, maybe we can come and save you from this embarrassment of your surgery <laughs> not working for the third time in a row, you know? Do you know what's so fun is actually any U triple P patient I have, I'll do a free home sleep test on them just because I want to see because they've had zero follow through and they think right. they're cured. And more often than not, they're still severe. So I, I hope, fortunately, the cutting has kind of decreased a little bit. Um, but anytime I talk to a dentist, they're like, well, what if it's not 100% successful? I'm like, you're, just, you're thinking like a dentist. Do you right. think the ENT lost sleep by charging for a $10,000 surgery that didn't work at all and put their patient in all this pain? I'm like, you're not putting your patients in pain, and you're not charging that much, so you can sleep at night. See, I'm, I mean, all about, I'm all about good sleep. That's right. It just <laughs> seems logical to me that you start with the most conservative, least mm -hmm. invasive treatment first, and you could make a good argument that that is, in fact, CPAP, um, because there's really nothing that has to be done if you can tolerate this air being blown through your airway all night long. And then the second least invasive would be an oral appliance, and then kind of work mm -hmm. your way uh, up from that if those two... Uh, don't work. So how many, roughly, how many appliances are you making a month now, do you think? That's like asking a woman her age or her weight. That's my next question. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, well, just, I, I was just trying to get a feel I'm for how... I'm just kidding. We do pretty good. We do pretty good. We're probably um, averaging about 30 appliances a month. And what are your favorite And appliances? I still do general dentistry. Um, I've really been using a lot of the dorsal fin um, appliance from Somnomed as well as um, Narval, which is a CAD-CAM milled um, polycarbon fiber, virtually indestructible, uh, very comfortable. The biggest reason why I probably don't do more is because you need teeth and you need retentive teeth. And I'm, again, in Idaho. And of course, Medicare doesn't cover those, so I love the Herbst as well for my Medicare patients. Although some Medicare patients opt out and they'll just pay the cash price to, to get the appliance they want. And the Medicare rule for, for covering an appliance is that it has to have um, a tube and sleeve or hinges. telescoping hinges. That's right. That's the uh, exact term. Yeah, what's interesting, there's a, there's a guy out of um, Utah that sends you an impression kit, the patient, since the patient, you take your the patient takes their own impressions, and it's basically two bleach trays with Velcro and telescoping hinges on the side, <laughs> and that's Velcro. Medicare approved Velcro. I like Velcro. That's an, that's an interesting way to titrate it, I guess, if you put some lines <laughs> on there that you can use the Velcro to titrate it, perhaps. But yeah, um, yeah, that Narval appliance is absolutely fantastic. I mean, yeah. it's just really well thought out. It's probably the most expensive one out of all the ones you order, I would guess. What you pay for? Hey, I've got good tastes. Mm -hmm. That's true. But we're Holy. getting medical. <laughs> we're getting medical insurance coverage for it. To me, it's not my bottom line. It's what are the patients going to wear. And then they they go report back to their physicians. 
and have a good experience. So um, it's been it's been really fun integrating this into my practice and um, actually having some good good months because of it. Well, it's interesting because one of the things that that I've noticed is that you know we all kind of hope for putting on eight or ten veneers on a patient and we hand them the mirror and it goes into slow motion and here comes our Oprah moment. They look in the mirror <laughs> and they smile for the first time and the tears start to roll down their face which I've had happen most of the time because they don't like how they look and they can't believe they're permanently <laughs> bonded. But sometimes they look and they're, oh, you know, they start to cry. But that's really rare. And where it happens more is with the treatment of, of sleep apnea because um, I've been hugged by more men as a result of this than anything yeah. else where they, where they say things like, I'm not falling asleep every day driving home from work. I now believe I'm going to be alive to see my two daughters get married. I forgot what it felt to feel good. I felt like yeah. crap for the last 15 years and I thought that's how everybody it. felt. Mm -hmm. They just live with it. kind of reaction? Oh yeah, my husband, he's, you know, again it's a small community so we'll go to a restaurant and I get hugs from the wife and the husband and they tell all their friends that are sitting with that, you know, I saved their life and saved their marriage and, you know, he'll see this from a distance and as soon as I come back to the table he goes, that was a sleep apnea patient, wasn't it? You know, your dental patients love you but it's just not the same. It's, yeah, it's not the same, and um, you know the, we don't quite have the post-operative sensitivity that we can <laughs> with extractions and you know endo and things like that. So it really is like if you can imagine um, a doctor who had maybe pre-existing uh, back problems, and as they sit to prep teeth, you know they have a hard time prepping multiple teeth or sitting there doing something like endo. You feel like this aspect of dentistry treating OSA could be good for somebody who's got a compromised back. I sure do. I know when I cut, because I have all sleep apnea on certain days, and I come back home just, you know, refreshed and rejuvenated. It's so fun. I absolutely, there's a lot of moving pieces. It is definitely a lot of hoops to jump for medical insurance and all that, but, you know, it's worth it for me because I love it. It, it just seems like, um, uh, I, I guess I guess you'd say lower stress as well, right? Even though there's complicated paperwork, you know, what, your staff has probably been well trained in, in how to get medical insurance reimbursement for these appliances, and so you probably feel less like uh, you know you where you stand up at the end of a long day of prepping yeah. teeth, and you're actually a little bit sore. You're like, ugh, what did I do today? <laughs> Nothing. I just went to work. I'm all about delegation. Did you have any exposure to uh, OSA or snoring treatment at Creighton? Not at all, but I keep trying to, you know, I send my obligatory Christmas card every year to the different departments, and I keep hoping that, you know, maybe they'll get, I'm hoping they'll get it in there at least a little bit. Yeah, it just seems like a real disservice um, uh, to patients that they, and it's unfortunate they just slip between dentistry uh, and medicine, and I feel like um, that we are really kind of well qualified, especially since we're going to be seeing them twice a year anyway if they're our yeah. dental patients. We're, we're on the front line. Well, you know, I did, I spoke at the de local dental society meeting and I was like, well, why would I do that when now everyone's going to go do it? But what we found is that they decided there's a lot more to it than just making an appliance. And they also realized that they could be screening their own patients, even if they don't treat them. I mean, I still get referrals from other dentists in town. Um, but how how lucky are we to know our patients, to be able to look in the airway and talk to them and get them help that they need? Exactly. What per, if you had to guess what percent of your patient population would you say would probably if they, if all your pa if somehow all your patients and I know this is five years in so you've already treated a lot of them. Oh well, well let's even go back five years and say out of all your patients, if they all somehow went home and wore and did a sleep a home sleep test, what percent of them do you think would end up uh, benefiting from an appliance? Well, that would even include primary snorers because when they include primary snorers in studies with oral appliances, their fatigue has gone down quite a bit and they kind of, I think, stop them from becoming apnics. Okay. Um, so that's hard to guess, but we all we know the average is one in four men and one in ten women have sleep apnea. Um, again, then there's primary snorers, but as when you get over the age of 50, it's up to 50%. And we have a pretty 
aged population here. A lot of people move up here to retire um, from California, even. So there's so it's hard to judge, but there's quite a few patients that I have, and there's sleep apnea patients that have become dental patients. And so you're not far away from Coeur d'Alene, right? Is the big city that's closest to you? Yep. And so you and now, Spokane. And Spokane, Spokane Washington. Mm -hmm. Washington, okay. But you've characterized uh, the citizens of Idaho as toothless and old. <laughs> it's pretty much. And I wouldn't be lying. <laughs> What's your favorite um, uh, OSA appliance for an edentulous patient? Um, I do make a herps, usually acrylic, and my hope, if you know, they're not real well-fitting dentures is to, uh, my partner places implants, so sometimes um, to get a better stabilized appliance, then we can do implants for them. Now the other area of dentistry that uh, I know you're very involved with, and again, it's, it's, it's so neat, it's such a fresh perspective for someone to say, yeah, I'm really active in obstructive sleep apnea, and I'm really active in, in orthodontics uh, as well. I know that you, um, you love doing six-month smiles. Um, love I, it. Start, I started doing ortho uh, probably about seven or eight years after I got out of dental school, which was long before. Uh, you got out of dental school, perhaps before you were even born, and, um, you know, it was it was interesting to me. Once you've had the opportunity to uh, bond brackets on the teeth and use arch wires, um, when you go to use removable aligners to move teeth, it's super frustrating because you're trying to push them with these little pieces of thermoform plastic, and I'm like, oh, if I could just put a steering wheel, a bracket on the tooth and put an arch wire in, I could move this thing really quickly. Tell me a little bit of how you originally got interested in doing uh, Six Month Smiles. Well, I think I got about as much ortho education as I did sleep apnea education in dental school. Our Which orthodontist none. retired men. I took the course and I know how to say extrusion and intrusion. So um, I did do Invisalign for a while, but very frustrating. And then it was finally when I became my own Invisalign patient that I realized that I needed to do something different. I was never really satisfied with the results, but even on myself, I just took them out. I was the, I'm the most non-compliant patient you could ever meet, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And so I went and took the six month smile course and absolutely fell in love with it because you can control the teeth so much more, you can move them faster, and patients don't mind them. And I've gotten some spectacular results. One of my favorite cases is a woman I know from the community, she's a bank teller, and she had really spaced flared teeth and in seven months completely transformed her smile and she told me when she came in she says I am getting asked out every day now I'm so annoyed I hate all these shallow people because I'm still the same person I'm like Julie you're not the same person look at your smile you, your whole demeanor is different the confidence is different so I think she finally got it well yeah I hate to disappoint Julie uh, but she, but she, and I'm assuming she was getting asked out by men. Uh, but we, we tend to be, uh, yeah, we tend to be more physical and kind of visually uh, oriented. And there's such a thing as animal magnetism where people just see somebody. And it's not to say that if you uh, spent six months with Julie working there at the bank with her that a guy could go, God, she's really sweet. I love her and fall in love. And that could happen. But it is that kind of thing where just seeing somebody you know, there's going to be probably more people attracted to her with her teeth, you know, all the teeth, all the spaces closed and the teeth lined up than there would be with all the spaces in there, even in Idaho. Right, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who want this treatment. Um, you know, people who never thought they would get braces or didn't even, you know, as soon as I bring it up to them, I'm like, what do you think of that tooth? They're like, oh, I hate that tooth. And that's just after I said, how do you like your smile? I like my smile. How do you like that too? Oh, I've always hated it. And it's because they think they need to go get bra metal braces for two years. Two years. And it's yeah. really expensive. So therefore, they just shut it out of their mind. I just did a treatment. I fixed a diastema on a 62-year-old man. And he's got the biggest, you know, Idaho beard. Right. You can hardly see his teeth. And he wanted to fix his face. His mom was kind of mad at me for doing that. But <laughs> that's him. But we, his wife told me uh, last week how he doesn't smile with his hand over his face now. And she just never realized that for this long it's, it's bugged him. And she was glad that he finally did something about it. 
Yeah, that is pretty amazing. And and when you when you've had your eyes opened um, to this type of adult orthodontics, you begin looking at teeth in a little different way, and you begin lo noticing mm -hmm. that almost every adult has lower anterior crowning, uh, and there's other things that they see. And like you said, when you ask them about that tooth, I had one guy tell me, I remember, uh, oh, this this tooth over this crooked lateral, he didn't say lateral incisor, but that's what it was. He said, uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to date again, and it's keeping me from dating. And I remember thinking, no, it's the fact that you have the inner personal skills of a wolverine uh, that's keeping you from dating. But I, but I said to him, you're absolutely right. Let's, let's straighten that out and see what happens. And I think his personality did actually change a little bit when his when his teeth were straightened as well. So you tried, like I did, the removable aligners, but I did it in the opposite order. I did the traditional ortho first and then the aligners after that. And here in America, even in Idaho, um, there's just such a uh, instant gratification mindset that you yeah. can, it's really difficult to get adults to commit to something for two years. Kids do it because they don't have a choice. You know, right. they, they do what their parents say. And, it could turn and their out peers to, are all doing it. Yeah, and they almost yeah. feel like uh, you know we're going to be perceived as poor yeah. if I show up without yeah. without brackets on. So, how did you get started? Where was your first training class? And uh, where it was, was it? in Chicago and t with Tony Feck. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you what, the Ryan Swain, who you know developed the system, it's so it's perfect for general dentists and easy uh, to do as a team with you know my assistants. And I'm not I can't sit down for an hour and place brackets. I just don't have the time and that's not profitable. So it's just a great system in which you can bond the brackets and um, directly they give you you know the trays that with the preset brackets and then the uh, wires are white and the donuts are clear. Everything is very minimal to um, the eye to see so patients have really loved it. I have my staff in Six Month Smiles at least one staff member at all times. So as soon as the next one's done, I think I'm next. And lastly, on this edition of Chairside Live, I've got a letter that I wanted to share with you from a Dr. Stonichi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And it says, uh, Dear Mike, in your last episode, you showed a three debutment, four unit fixed bridge with outrageous preparations and even worse undercuts. We don't know how it started, but we can see how it ended a total failure. Even on the third try, there were undercuts relative to the three preps. Granted, it is not easy to see all the aspects of multiple preparations, but to send something like this to the lab is total incompetence. I suspect that the 3D printed resin did not exactly fit right because the buckle margin on the premolar seemed to be open. Yeah, there's always a compromise there. Be that as it may, in order to avoid all that lost time, lost cost, but most of all, lost face, there are ways to check on the parallelism of your axial walls before you send it in. I teach our students two ways. When you complete the preps, fabricate the temporary bridge. If it goes on and off easily, the mutual tapers are probably correct. So you, ha you do have to wonder, because it brings up a great point, you know, when you have these preparations that you think you're going to draw and you're request requesting a bridge, at the end of that appointment, you are going to make a temporary bridge. And if, in fact, it draws and goes back into place, you should feel pretty comfortable at sending that impression in, but with the amount of undercut we saw, once we poured the model and scanned it, how in the world were you able to make a, a temporary bridge on that case? And you, we know that you would not have been able to, except for making some changes like we did on the models. And this might be one of those cases where the dentist simply put, and I've seen dentists do this before, you know, single unit temporaries on each of the abutments without placing a bridge. That always scares me because I don't want to have that much movement in these teeth. I always figure that if you have, let's say, three abutments for a four or five unit bridge and you don't connect them with a provisional bridge, there's a pretty good chance they're going to move around. These teeth have had a certain hard tissue structure for the enamel and they've been in contact with the opposing teeth for, let's say, 20 years. Now we're going to change that, alter it, put some plastic on the top of it. And if we don't stabilize those teeth by hooking them together, and they probably can still move even then, but at least they're hooked as a unit, I'd be worried about that. So I love this suggestion of prepping a bridge and really even before you impress it or do anything else, make a quick temporary bridge. In fact, it doesn't even have to look good. Just put the bisacryl on, let it set, take it off and see if you can get it off without breaking it. That would be your indication that it would be okay to send it in. His second suggestion is make a quick impression of the preps, pour it up, you do with some slurry stone, 
and placed the model on a surveyor. And as he points out, if you don't have a surveyor, then you must be a periodontist, which is his way of saying get a surveyor unless, in fact, you are a periodontist. And check the slope of the axial walls. You can easily see the taper on all sides of the preps and then make the corrections in the mouth. So that would absolutely be true, too. You know, we're looking for a kind of a polyurethane thing that you could be able to mix, like in a yogurt container, and pour it into your model and have something that sets in the matter of 60 or 90 seconds without having to mix stone on a vibrator. Um, I know Parkell has their Mach 2 dye silicone, so you could actually just squirt that with a gun into that quick impression that you take. It sets in a couple minutes, and you could put that on a surveyor uh, as well and be able to see whether or not you have parallelism. And so I like that first step because the temporary bridge, if it does come off, well, great. Now we're well on the way to the temporary bridge. Let's go ahead and pack the cord, take the impression, and during that time, the assistant can be working on the temporary bridge. Uh, if the temporary bridge doesn't work and cracks in half, that would be a great time to snap a quick impression. It could even be from alginate or an alginate replacement material, which is only about 12 cents a gram, not that much more than alginate at six cents a gram. Yeah, I know it's twice as much, but to go from six cents to 12 cents a gram, not a big deal. Maybe start, squirt something like the dye silicone in there and take it to the surveyor and see for yourself exactly where the issues are and then make those changes in the mouth. Hopefully one day, you know, you'll have an acquisition unit in your office. You'll be able to scan those teeth, send it to us or whatever lab you're working with. Technician can pull it up and actually look at the models there and run it through some uh, design software and say, well, here's where your undercarts are and share the image with you and hopefully be able to fix it in an easier way then. I don't know if that's easier, it just sounds more high tech, but whether or not it's easier, I'm not really sure. So we appreciate the feedback and I like those two ideas. Make the temporary bridge, see in fact if you have draw, take an impression, make a quick model, put it on the survey or measure it and see if it works. So thanks so much for those two suggestions. Great ways to verify whether or not you have undercuts while the patient's still anesthetized and still in the chair. Well, that about wraps it up for episode 111 of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry.